This lecture was created as part of the 2022 Fall Lecture Series with a theme of My Geneva Is, Then and Now, in conjunction with a photograph exhibit of the same name. This first lecture took place in September in the Geneva Public Library's Historic Reading Room. Geneva was still very much in its infancy when Lot 88 became populated. Buildings did not have street numbers, but advertisements for homes or businesses in the area of Castle and Main appear in the paper in its earliest days. This map was drawn up for the village in the 1790s. From this map, in comparisons to newspaper articles, we learn that Sanford Williams occupied Lot 88 at the corner of Castle and Main Streets by 1808. It's unclear when the property changed hands until 1834. The Universalist Society held its first worship in America in 1778. The 1830s was its peak of popularity, becoming the ninth largest denomination in the United States, on par with the number of Catholics. In 1834, the Universalist Society of Geneva held its first worship service in a schoolhouse on Geneva Street. The group had already started discussions about obtaining property to build a church. The first entry in the church's ledger appears on February 2, 1835, with a listing of its first trustees. In 1834, the Society bought Lot 88 for $500. Emily Prescott, a grocer and trustee, donated $6,500 to build and equip the church. He is credited with supervising the construction of the Universalist Church and presenting it to the Society. On May 6, 1835, the church was dedicated and Reverend Jacob Chase was installed as the pastor of the First Society of Universalists in Geneva. The first image of the church building comes just a year and two months later from visiting artist Henry Walton. Zooming in, we can see the church and are able to identify it in relation to other churches on Main Street. The Universalist Church can be described as simplistic in nature, when looking at Geneva's churches built around the same era. The Dutch Reformed Church, the Associate Reformed Church, the First Presbyterian Church, and the Methodist Episcopal Church all have similar features, including the columns and slope of the roof. All except the Associate Reformed are still standing today, though only the First Presbyterian remains a church. In comparison, the Universalist Church lacks the fancy columns and decorative features on the steeple, and despite the black and white image, we can see it does not have the deep color of the plain brick or the clean white of the Associate and Dutch Reformed churches. Likewise, some Geneva churches possess distinctive shapes in their windows or tower construction that the Universalist Church does not have. What is clear are the signs pointing to its federal style. The federal style, based on the work of Scottish architect Robert Adam, is typically a simple square or rectangular box, two or three stories high. It features side lights flanking the front door, elliptical fan-shaped windows over a paneled front door, and lintel-type window heads. What is also interesting is that this style was already well on its way out of fashion when the church was built which could account for the Greek Revival roof style that we saw in the other churches as it started to take over in 1820. There isn't much information on if the church physically changed from 1834 until this image from the James Vale collection. A notable moment is that in the 1850s, Geneva was home to Lydia Ann Jenkins, the first female Universalist preacher and among the earliest ordained female ministers in the U.S. Along with her husband, Edmund Jenkins, they had moved to Geneva by 1853, where they both would preach before obtaining their letters of fellowship. In June 1860, the Ontario County Association of Universalists was held in Geneva, where they were both ordained as ministers and assigned to the Clinton, New York Universalist Society. Like most churches, the Universalists made some of their money by selling pews to families, sort of like assigned seats. This drawing from the church ledger also identifies where the pulpit was, with a hallway in the very front splitting the outside doors from the inside doors where people entered the church, as it remains today. Pews ran along the walls with two aisles and two sets of pews running down the middle. We can see the drawing come to life in the next couple of photos. 
The front of the reading room remains virtually unchanged to this day. The two side doors flank the pulpit area, and one stairway to the balcony area still exists. It's a testament to the building owners, that being only the church and the library in its almost 200 years, that much of the structure in this original section is still present to preserve that history. It's likely this building is the oldest in Geneva that has been home to so few organizations. At some point in the 1880s, a porch was added on to the front of the building. At that time, the lintel type window heads were removed, the church was painted, and the side light was removed from the front. I couldn't find any reasoning for the porch addition. However, Genevans all over the village started adding porches to their homes in a wave of porch mania. The board and batten design is reflected of the Queen Anne style, which spanned the years 1880 to 1900. Meanwhile, the demand for a library was ever present in Geneva. As early as 1797, James Rees held one share in a Geneva library before Geneva was officially organized. Though there were many attempts to start libraries over the century, in 1887, there was enough interest to start a circulating library. The YMCA offered the use of a room in their building, the former Associate Reformed Church, purposely fitted up for the storing of books in 1888. The library was open every day except Sunday, from 9 to 12 and 2 to 4, plus a few evenings a week. The newspaper reported 308 books checked out in January 1888 and 517 in February, reflecting the interests of Genevans. The Geneva Circulating Library Association was formed by several ladies to support the continued success of the library. It's likely that when the YMCA decided to dismantle this building in 1892, in favor of constructing a new building, the library was put on hold. Based on YMCA annual reports, the library did continue on after the Y reopened in 1894. Other libraries surfaced at the turn of the century at St. Francis de Sales Church, Sweets Drug Store, and J.W. Smith's Dry Goods Store. In addition, the Hobart College and high school libraries were available for resource use. The wave of Carnegie libraries across the country led to local speculation that Andrew Carnegie would fund a library in Geneva, as he had done for other cities in America. An anonymous woman wrote to Carnegie, and the newspaper published the results in 1902. Carnegie required the city to take the first initiative and an assurance there would be an endowment in place of around $25,000. The school board was approached, but could only endow $1,500 a year. A couple weeks later, New York State Inspector of Public Libraries, William Yost, visited Geneva on February 11, 1902, and recommended to the YMCA that if they followed a few regulations, they would have no trouble obtaining a grant from the state to support a free public library. It's interesting that Yost makes a distinction between a free public library versus the YMCA's library, as that indicates there must have been some sort of membership requirement to use their library. Unfortunately, six days later, the YMCA was completely destroyed by fire, gutting the entire building. This destroyed the uninsured library books too. While there were hopes of reopening the YMCA, it took two years to rebuild. And this is the building on Castle Street we see today. Despite this rebuild, there was no evidence the library continued. The vision of a Carnegie Library was still present in 1904 when the YMCA reopened, but did not have city support beyond one common council member. The newspaper kept the idea of a free library in the forefront of the minds of Genevans, and as a result, in January 1905, the Daughters of the American Revolution put forth the idea of a free library fund. The group began holding fundraising events and formed the Geneva Free Library, obtaining a provisional charter and signing a constitution in 1905. The constitution required that five trustees should always be members of the Seneca chapter DAR. Genevans donated many volumes of books to the cause, many in memory of others. However, this was still not a true free and public library. Membership would cost $50 for life members, $5 per year to be a supporting member, and $1 per year for an annual member. That money would go towards the purchase of a site and building fund, an endowment fund, 
and to equip the library. But where would the library operate? The YMCA once again offered rooms in their building for the storage of books. In the upper floor, the Geneva Free Library started with 714 books at its opening date on May 14, 1906. Their first librarian was Mary Hayes, who was engaged for a term of two months. In July, the trustees raised her salary as long as the library was open at least one evening a month. Mary held the position until her death in October 1906, and her sister Margaret was hired to continue. The library soon outgrew their space and moved to the rear of the Wheat Building at the corner of Seneca Linden Streets with over 3,000 books. Trustee Charles Hemiup approached the Common Council for financial support and was refused in 1906, but the community continued their support. Library trustee H.A. Wheat, on behalf of Wild's Drug Store, offered use of the firm's new soda fountain for one afternoon in the summer of 1907 to raise money for the building fund. The DAR continued their fundraising efforts through food sales and a secondhand bookstall at their holiday sale in 1908. Children at the high school gave a concert on their own to benefit the library too. Meanwhile, the Universalist Society replaced their floors and ceiling and added new seating to their building in 1905. Though they had wanted to add on to the rear of the church, they decided to defer this work for the time being. The church also offered use of the space in early 1910 to the Methodist congregation who were making plans to construct a new church across the street. At the time, the Geneva Advertiser-Gazette described the interior as comfortable and having ample room for 150 people in the gallery. There are no records from the church which indicate whether the Universalists were suffering financially. However, the popularity of the religion was decreasing locally, and it's likely the congregation was thinning out. Among the remaining congregation was Charles Hemiup, whose ancestor, Emily Prescott, was the main contributor to the construction of the church. Charles was also a trustee of the library, and along with several other Genevans invested in both organizations, may have proposed the idea of using the church for the library as it was starting to outgrow the wheat building by 1910. With volumes approaching the 10,000 mark and an annual circulation of over 12,000, the library needed a much larger location. Church and library trustee William Fink was approached regarding the possibility of leasing the Universalist Church in November 1910. The church agreed to lease at a rate of $250 per year, and by December 8th, the library had moved in. By 1915, the institution was moving for city support. Circulation was increasing each year, and the DAR felt the future of the library was assured. It was then that the DAR made a resolution forfeiting their control over the makeup of the Board of Trustees. This was an interesting move, as the library still seemed to struggle with fundraising. A decision by the Universalist Church to remit the rent in September 1916 and gift $50 meant the Library Association had a little extra cash on hand, but this came with strings. It's clear from the Universalist Church minutes that as of August 1916, they were making plans to deed their property to the State Convention of the Universalists. There were several motions in their August meeting, including the refunding of the rent and making the cash gift to the library, but also gifting $250 to the city hospital, giving their small organ to Mrs. Chapman, and leaving all personal property of the church in the hands of its trustees. The announcement that the building was turned over to the Universalist General Convention came quickly after with reassurances that the lease would hold until December, but this alarmed the library trustees. The church trustees eventually said the building was not for sale yet, but would advise when it was ready to sell. This led to an uncertainty for the Library Association, which became worse in February 1917 when a letter was sent by the State Convention to vacate the church by mid-March. A committee of library trustees visited the Universalist trustees in Syracuse to make an appeal. The resulting decision was the library would not have to vacate until a trial had been made, which could be done without interfering in the work of the library. Meanwhile, library trustees discussed their options which included purchasing a new building or lot, or the possibility of purchasing their current building from the convention trustees. 
The entrance of America into World War I was a setback for plans to sell the church, but it was advantageous in the long run for the library's building fund. Along with many other towns, Geneva formed the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Incorporated to support those in the military service upon their return. The library itself gathered over 300 volumes and magazines to send to New York State for use by military personnel in 1918. After the conclusion of the war, a group of library trustees went to Syracuse again to convince Universalist officials to sell the building to the association. A reciprocal visit was made in September 1919 by the Universalist Society's Finance Committee and State Superintendent, who agreed to sell the property to the Library Association for $8,000 with options for purchasing adjoining properties. The Soldiers and Sailors Group formed committees to discuss options for a memorial in Geneva. The Memorial Committee was set to vote in October 1919 about what form the memorial would take. An overwhelming majority of the committee voted for a memorial library, which led to the Library Association passing a resolution to postpone the purchase of the Universalist property for six months in case the citizens did not establish a memorial library. But Geneva was busy with many fundraising campaigns in the post-war period. At the time, the Soldiers and Sailors group were needing to raise money for a library. There were three other campaigns happening in succession. This meant delays for several months, and it was advised that the Library Association should move forward with purchasing the church building and adjoining properties to secure them for the memorial, and the group would make up any loss the library would suffer. One last delay from the influenza epidemic, causing a lack of a trustee quorum January through March 1920, and the closing of the library in February, meant the library trustees failed to meet until April 1920. When they voted to purchase the church properties using funds raised from members. The $2,000 raised plus $6,000 in mortgage were accepted in a verbal agreement by the Universalists. A surprise donation of $5,000 from Dr. and Mrs. W. W. Hopkins in memory of her mother, Anna Hogarth Young, meant the library needed to raise just $1,000 more to secure the property in cash. The property was officially purchased by the Library Association in February 1921, with a resolution that in effect said the purchase was the cornerstone of the future Memorial Library. The minutes read, said library to be erected on this site and adjoining sites in memory of the soldiers and sailors of the Civil and World War who gave their lives for country and cause. In 1923, the library underwent extensive alterations. There is no report of the porch or spire being removed from the building as seen as in this image, but it's likely that this is when that event occurred. A side light was also returned to the front, though not as large, to reflect the original construction. Inside the library, new stacks and uniform size were rearranged with all reference material in the gallery above, and a dedicated reading room was created by rearranging tables below. The front desk was moved into the front alcove where the pulpit formerly stood, and plans were being made to move the children's books near the entrance. New paint and windows for the first floor meant noise for visitors, but they continued to patronize the library. It's unclear when, but the three other properties purchased at 222 Main, 230 Main, and 212 Castle Streets were demolished so the land could be prepared for a suitable memorial. The 1920s were not a financially secure time for the library. Attempts to put the library under the city budget failed, while minutes reveal the financial condition was, quote, sufficiently appalling. Having relied on the community chest and membership support, the library trustees considered a campaign for tax support to have a more reliable source of income. Then at the December 14, 1927 meeting, the trustees made the decision to close the library as of January 1st, advising the librarian to call in all the books checked out. Not wanting to see the library close, a Mrs. Endicott donated $1,000 before the end of the month to postpone the closure, and the trustees reversed the decision. The popularity among the community continued despite the financial struggles. 
the depression year has been an increased number of users through circulation and the use of the building itself by groups coming to the library for instruction. This was tempered by cuts to the library's budget from the city, leading to less available open hours. The secretary wrote, once again, our dream of expansion was discussed, and as usual, nothing definite could be determined until we are in a financial position to do it. While the trustees agreed to transfer all its interest in real estate as soon as the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial could raise funds for a memorial building, the group failed to raise enough money to purchase a building site for a memorial library or any other memorial. In 1937, the Library Association, in consideration of a future cash gift from the memorial group, were to take the necessary steps to change the name of the library, with two members of the Soldiers and Sailors joining the Library Board with restricted powers. The complications of changing the library's incorporated name were bypassed, as a state official suggested just changing the name of the building, as other libraries had done across the state. This is why the front of the building, has the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Library name on the front even today. A plaque which reads, to every hero of her every war, the American nation is grateful, replaced the centennial marker, which was then moved to where the cornerstone would have been. Yet no money was forthcoming from the memorial group until 1942. It's clear from both the Soldiers and Sailors group and the library's minutes that the groups did not foresee using the current building for long. There were still plans in the works to purchase another suitable building site or to completely demolish the current building for a new one. 1941 saw a drop in circulation for the library as general world unrest, war, and FDR's political campaign had an effect on the community at large. The polio epidemic had a local effect too, when in 1944, a drop in juvenile fiction, circulation, and the forced abandonment of story hour as a health precaution meant that fewer families were coming in to use the library. A fuel emergency in February 1945 saw the closure of the library for all. In 1942, the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Fund had finally been able to pay expenses for the group and had a balance that it paid over to the library of $2,997.13. The group then disbanded. The building fund totaled over $30,000 by 1945, thanks to war bonds, mortgages, and donations. By 1950, progress had been made in persuading the Common Council to increase the city's contribution because of constantly rising costs of books, materials, and staff. Little in the way of building changes could be seen until 1954 with the installation of a modern heating plant. This gave the library the opportunity to move the children's room into the now empty basement. Since 1939, the children's section was on the west end of the balcony where it was overcrowded and accessible only via the staircase at the front of the building. The desk in the children's area was the upper part of the pulpit used in the Universalist Church. Some of the bookcases were created from material found in the cellar, and other chairs and tables were cobbled together from various other pieces. The unfinished cellar and newspaper storage were converted to the children's room in 1955. It featured custom-built shelves, was three times larger than the former balcony space, and a door was added onto the main street side to create an entrance to the children's room. On move-in day, the children formed a line to move books down the stairs and into the new space which featured new furnishings. At that time, a stairway to the basement still existed in the left-hand side doorway. The newspaper described the room in detail. Wall color, easy on the eyes, the floor was cream and brown marbleized linoleum, deeply recessed windows with wide ledges, medium-height furniture to fit the children, and color everywhere with placement of vases and decorations. The library restroom was also renovated and redecorated. Although the library continued to add to the building fund, nothing drastic was being done to the actual building. Its number of volumes had grown, meaning space was becoming scarce both for materials and people. By the late 1950s, it became clear the library was not moving to a new site. Instead, in April 1959, 
Warren Hunting Smith suggested to the trustees to put on an addition to the building and gave shares of stock equaling over $20,000. Combined with a large bequest and a building fund campaign over the next two years, the total had reached just over $80,000. The building campaign allowed the library to add onto the back of the building. The double doors led out into where the current magazine room is today. The plan for the three floor addition included two floors of open stacks, a vault, and in the basement, a heating plant and storage space. In her 1960 annual report, head librarian Dorothy Craig described the earlier than expected scramble to move books off the back wall of the library as workmen were ahead of schedule. There were books covering every table and boxes underneath furniture to make way for the official knockdown of the wall. The library steadfastly remained open until November 1960 when it became too dangerous for patrons and staff alike to find their way through the stacks of boxes. After closure, the books were moved into the addition, the shelving units were pulled away from the balcony wall. The old bookcases from the main reading room were cut apart to be fitted into the new magazine room, and renovations began in the original portion of the building. The library was finally able to reopen in March 1961 after three months of delays. The whole project added 2,712 square feet to the library. All nonfiction books were moved to the new adjustable stacks in the addition. The old and new section were tied together using a color scheme of Pompeian red and Granada gold. There was new lighting, new flooring, furniture, a museum case, and stacks and racks. Walls were painted gold, the balcony appeared white, and the flooring was beige tile with accents of red. The lighting fixtures were also reflective of the time period. The reference department had been changed from the north side of the room to the Castle Street side. The balcony was cleared with plans to level the floor and make the railing higher to create a magazine room for quiet study. The new addition housed storage for reference material and local history material, staff storage, and more office space for the growing staff. The choice was to keep the same architectural style on the Castle Street side, but the North Main Street facing wall was transformed into a wall of windows, a design feature of mid-century modern architecture. Based on research done by a preservation company, the original front doors to the library were painted green, during the 1920s renovation, the doors were painted in earthy red. During the 1960s renovation, they were painted a brighter red as seen here. The side light remained and the main entryway stayed on the corner with the separate entrance to the children's room. Not much was done to the children's room during renovations, but it kept separate open hours from the rest of the library. A parent-teacher alcove was created in the new wing so that parents and teachers could still have access to a selection of books when the children's room was closed. By 1962, the Pioneer Library System was organized, and all the libraries in Ontario, Wayne, Livingston, Wyoming, and Monroe counties joined except for Geneva. There was a small amount of controversy in the Geneva community about why the library had not joined, but the library board members sent a letter to the Geneva Times that stated they were taking their time to discuss the options before forging ahead. In 1974, a decision was made to join the Ontario County Cooperative Library System to take advantage of the items in that system and in the Pioneer Library System. And by 1990, with the reorganization of PLS to include only Ontario, Wayne, Wyoming and Livingston counties, Geneva had officially joined the system and been appointed the central library. The 1960s edition had added over 2,000 square feet to the library's property, but as patronage grew in the 1980s and the library increased its holdings, it became clear that the library needed to expand again. The board made it clear 
The additional expansion would not detract from the original structure, but enhance it by using the main room and balcony for what the library originally intended, a distinctive reading and reference room. Circulation had exponentially grown from 34,000 in 1961 to well over 180,000 by the early 1980s. The designation of being the central library meant the library had annual state aid to provide nonfiction, reference tools and books, as well as additional staff and equipment for the 40 libraries in the system. The library addressed their needs as being additional shelf space to house 100,000 volumes, more efficient workspace for library staff, space for large print books, audiobooks, and video cassettes, a quiet space for study and reading, private meeting space, more storage space, and a space to house reference resources. Advancing technology also meant a need for a new area to house computers and microfilm or microfiche readers. Additionally, the historic nature of the library meant it was difficult to serve the handicapped, elderly, or others who had difficulty entering or using the building when the main entrance was accessible only via a set of stairs and the second floor by a larger set of stairs. Geneva Free Library first opened its doors on May 14, 1906 in an upper room of the YMCA and never yet has it occupied a facility designed as a library. The present building, though charming, is neither accessible to the handicapped nor functionally efficient. It has always been too cramped and is hopelessly inadequate. The library has literally outgrown its present home at the intersection of Castle and Main Streets. Is it any wonder the Board of Trustees has committed to a capital campaign that will help preserve, renovate, and expand the library? Today, as a major community resource center, Geneva Free Library provides a full range of services to meet the diverse needs of the people it serves. Geneva Free Library is the hub and heartbeat of our area. Geneva's living room, so to speak. Our area definitely has benefited from having the library in the center of town. The library had some room to expand. There was a parking lot behind the building on Castle Street, in addition to a larger one on North Main. In 1991, the library started a capital campaign to realize the large construction and renovation project. Its success? led to the groundbreaking in 1993. Pictured with the shovel is director Frank Queener, who oversaw the campaign and a bulk of the expansion. He kindly let me pick his brain about the color of the doors, which had changed again. Frank himself painted the doors in 1990 to this earthy red that was mixed at the paint shop on Exchange Street. Frank's exact words were, I guess he never came near the library to come up with that red. The original portion of the building, plus the 1960 addition, added up to 8,000 square feet. But this new structure would add over 16,000 square feet to the entire footprint of the library. The 1960s wall of windows was removed to merge the new construction with the old. A second expansion on the back of the 1962 addition would give space to a new elevator, mechanical room, ground level entrance, and office space. The original architectural style was kept in mind during the planning. The entryway doors on Castle Street mimicked the shape of the doors in the former main entrance on the corner. The windows were done in the same style as the original portion and a smaller side light was also mounted both on the side and the front. Additionally, the doors were returned to a green color, also mimicked throughout the building with the front doors no longer being used as an entrance. Phase one of the expansion was completed in 1994, and the entire exterior was done in the federal style. Employees moved some 100,000 items from the old building into the new expansion using top shopping carts. A terrace was added onto the North Main Street facing side, and an entryway into the new children's room was added to the back of this expansion. 
The building was now handicap accessible. The nonfiction and fiction areas could now house many more volumes and furnishings. And the children's area doubled in size thanks to a whole new basement also dug out. The children's room in the original basement was then moved into the new portion of the building and phase two could begin. Phase two included closing the original portion of the building to undergo its own renovations. The grand opening was held in 1995 and revealed the present day. Reading room, which had received a new foundation, heating, electrical, and plumbing systems, carpeting, and newly painted walls. The second floor became a study loft and home to the local history collection, and the basement was converted into a community meeting room. The vision from the Capital Campaign brochure meant the footprint of the library was over 24,000 square feet between the three floors. In 2005, voters of the Geneva City School District passed a public library referendum to create the Geneva Public Library. And in February 2006, the Board of Regents granted that charter. That year marked the 100th anniversary of the library's incorporation. Previously, young adult books were shelved in the second floor. In 2008, a teen room was created on the ground floor to give teen patrons a place to gather, read, and talk. Increased state support through a construction grant only for libraries meant a new source of funding for libraries across the state to improve their buildings. In 2013, the library realized its next big project with renovations on the ground floor. Phase one included electrical work to upgrade the internet, the walls were painted, and a carpet installed throughout the children's and teen areas. Phase two would move the circulation desk and improve the HVAC system. The new children's room created a better flow to the space with the shelving moved around to organize books in order from youngest readers to chapter books, several areas for interactive play, sectional seating, and a new location for the children's desk. The latest work has been done to add a parking lot to the south side of the building. With planning starting in 2019, the library eventually purchased the former Tui Insurance Building, which was demolished in March 2020. Just days later, the COVID-19 pandemic would close the library for several months, but the project persisted through, and the parking lot was officially opened on October 7, 2020, with a joint in-person and digital event. The fact that this building has only had two owners in its almost 200-year history, and that the library is dedicated to maintaining its original character, makes this building noteworthy for the city of Geneva.